Welcome back to another episode of Brain Buzz Podcast. I am your host, Drake. And today we are we have the luxury of having Dr. David Schiffman on. He's a marine uh, marine conservation biologist and a postdoctoral researcher at Arizona State University. Uh, and he's interested in sustainable management of marine and coastal resources. Uh, and we're going to be talking a lot about sharks sharks today because Shark Week's coming up. And I actually asked David on because of that, because his work's so relevant to that. And he actually is a, you know, he's the leading Twitter researcher on shark, shark, sharks, I guess. Um, his pictures on uh, when he's in the field holding sharks are they can rival all the Tinder profiles of men holding up tiny little sharks. It's amazing. You got to check them out. I'm excited to have you on, David. Thanks for coming. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So, so David, we got you on today because um, mainly because I was like, oh sh- shit, Shark Week is coming up, and and. I, I know you as a... Man, as have a I said follower. that exact sentence so many times? <laughs> oh, shit, Shark Week's coming up. <laughs> Shark Week's coming up soon. Uh, and we're going to be publishing this, you know, in the midst of Shark Week. And and we'll talk about your opinions on Shark Week as well. But I'm just, I'm glad that you're on because, you, you know, you are, we love to have researchers on that are experts in the field. And you are truly one of the experts in uh, sharks, marine biology and conservation. Wonderful. Yeah. So, so, so David, tell us quickly, let's, let's lead with some shark facts just to kind of draw people in and then we'll kind of get more specific in our, in our questions. Okay. Sure. What, what the easy, an easy, like a low hanging fruit here. What makes sharks cool to you as a marine biologist? I have loved sharks since I was maybe two. Uh, I feel like most kids go through a shark thing or a dinosaur thing. Mm. Uh, and I actually had both of those, but chose sharks. <laughs> but I I still get the same sense of awe and wonder when I see one that I did when I was a toddler at the at the shark tank at the Pittsburgh Zoo. Uh, but they're they're just an, an amazingly diverse and powerful of uh, and in some cases enormous group of animals, and they play really really important roles in healthy functioning ecosystems. Many species are in serious need of conservation attention. They attract uh, they attract me really at all levels. They're fascinating and awe-inspiring. They're really important to have around and they need they need our help. Yeah. And we're going to talk a lot about, you know, the conservation aspect and why, you know, why they're so important to the ecosystem. But I mean, for me, I've actually never seen a shark in my life. Um, and I, and I, <laughs> I knew you'd Aren't probably you react that way. Yeah, I am at UBC too. There's an aquarium right in town. I know, I know. I and I mean, I, there's a million things that I said I should be doing, David, in the last five years that I've never gotten to. Oh, so I, I mean, I'm feeling. trying to pick away at it. Um, but I mean, a lot of people will never see, and I assume I will never see a shark in, uh, you know, in its actual natural habitat, right? And it's, it's just not feasible for most people that don't live in coastal regions. Um, but what do you think? Um, for people that you know that aren't really well versed with sharks, where are sharks? Are there sharks in the river, and what kind of sharks are in the rivers? You know, in the you know North America or I mean all around the world, where are you most likely to find these sharks, and where are the most like precarious spots that you could actually find sharks that people might not know about? Yeah, so U.S. Navy SEALs uh, have a joke that there's a test to see if there are sharks in the water, which is you dip your finger in the water and taste it. And if it's salty, you're in the ocean. So there are sharks in the water. <laughs> uh, and that's true. There are sharks in just about every marine habitat you can imagine. Some live under Arctic ice. Some live in the deepest parts of the ocean where it's so dark that light never reaches. But it's also incomplete because there absolutely are sharks that live in freshwater. Uh, mm. Bull sharks can famously go hundreds of miles up freshwater. Uh, there are dozens of species of sharks that can temporarily enter brackish or freshwater. And there are some species of sharks that live in freshwater basically their whole lives. Those typically live in Southeast Asia, Northern Australia. They're called glyphous sharks. Um, and they're unfortunately all critically endangered. Generally mm-hmm. speaking, if you're a wild animal, being farther away from humans is better for you. And being in a river is closer to humans than being in the middle of the ocean. When it comes to like... The river sharks and this, like the saltwater sharks, or just your general sharks, are there any significant differences in their biology? Uh, in how they in their excretory systems, mostly uh, how their their kidney like structures work, um, and how they okay. deal with how they deal with osmoregulation and things like that. 
Uh, this gets complicated and not especially interesting pretty quick. But from the outside, you can tell that you're definitely looking at a shark. If you look at a glyphus shark, uh, it, it looks pretty much like a typical shark. Mm-hmm. Speaking of which, what defines a shark? Because I know, you know, is it the f- it, there's a fin and sharp teeth. That's the, pretty much my understanding of it. Yeah. I'm sure there's a lot more to it. There is. So sharks and their relatives, which are the skates, the rays, and the chimeras, uh, they're a, they are fish, but they're a different group of fish from something like a tuna or a goldfish or a bass that people may be more familiar with. Those are called the bony fishes. Sharks, skates, rays, and chimeras are the cartilaginous fishes. And the difference is what their skeletons are made out of. A bony fish like us have skeletons made of bone. But sharks um, and their relatives, their skeletons aren't made of bone. They're made of cartilage, which is what our nose and what our ears are made out of. And that's notably much lighter and more flexible and heals faster than bone. It also means that some sharks are flexible enough that if you grab them on the tail, they can turn around and bite your hand. Um, so that, that's the main difference. Uh, what makes it, it, The difference between sharks, skates, rays, and chimeras has to do with body plan organization and things like that. Uh, but that, that's what makes a, the cartilaginous fishes different from the bony fishes. So all sharks have that, are car, like, basically cartilage and have that flexibility then so even like a great white shark would have more flexibility than one would expect yes okay that's scarier than i (laughs) when i'm thinking about it now that makes a lot more scary there there is the like you know the common like belief or sentiment about sharks is that they are scary and a lot of people do have fear of the ocean or swimming in, in open water because of sharks Why do you think, is it just because of Jaws or do you think like what, what caused this kind of like irrational fear of sharks? Yeah, that's a great question. And National Geographic wrote a a article that I think was not trying to be hilarious, but I thought was hilarious about this. And their conclusion was why do, why are people afraid of sharks? Because sharks are large wild predators that can potentially hurt us. And it kind of (laughs) makes sense to be afraid of them. It doesn't make sense to panic. It doesn't make sense to be afraid to even go swimming in a swimming pool. Uh, But treating them with a healthy respect is probably good. Uh, Mm -hmm. And as far as Jaws, Jaws absolutely changed the world in in a way that very few movies do. If I ask most people to think think of a shark, what they think of is the shark from Jaws. Uh, The only other thing that's even remotely similar is another Spielberg. Uh, if I ask you people to picture a dinosaur, they picture the T-Rex or Velociraptor from Jurassic Park, even though we know that's not what they look like. Uh, so, yeah, people really didn't think about sharks very much before Jaws. Do you think there was an upswing in the fascination or interest in marine biology due to Jaws? Or do you there think that it may was. have staggered it? Yeah, the, the, de- the generation, sort of a half academic generation ahead of me, uh, reports being inspired to become a marine biologist because of the Hooper character, the Richard Dreyfuss character on Jaws. One of the stars of the movie is a marine biologist, and that had never been done before. Mm-hmm. And people thought, wow, this is a job? I want to learn more about this. It inspired a whole generation of ocean scientists. Uh, it also inspired a worldwide panic and fear about sharks in a way that we didn't really have much before. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I know... I mean, even coming from a small town in the country, in the countryside of like Ontario, I know lots of people that are would say, oh, if I could do things over again, I'd love to be a marine biologist because there's just so much interest in the ocean mm-hmm. and, and the animals that inhabit it. That being said, I also know or my opinion of the ocean is that I'm scared of it because there's so much unknown. And, and the, really, how much do we know about the ocean and the amount of sharks that are in it or just animals in general? Yeah, particularly the places where people go, like the beach or right off the beach. We know we know a great deal. There are new yeah. species being discovered all the time. There's a new species of shark, skate ray, or chimera discovered about every two weeks. But um, there's there we that doesn't mean that that uh, giant murderous sea monsters are hiding just out of sight. It just means that there's plenty for me to do. <laughs> um, but yeah, if you're, I mean, if you're, a, if you're afraid of the ocean, there are lots of other fun things you can do on vacation, but it certainly don't, don't let irrational fear ruin your life and keep you from doing cool stuff. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm not afraid of the beach or anything like that. Like that's completely fine. It's just once you get into the, you know, water, like the like, large bodies of water where you're kind of stranded, that's the, that's, I think is reasonable for humans to be scared of because it's not our natural environment and we're not comfortable, you know? 
being exposed like that. But anyway, we're not we're not talking about being scared here. We're talking about the fascination of sharks and why they're so awesome. Um, so are sharks the a, a couple more questions about sharks just because sure. I'm so naive about sharks and, I, and you're the one person in the world that I can talk to and have all the answers probably. Are sharks the like top apex predator in the ocean? Yeah, so orcas are. Uh, orcas okay. eat great whites. Orcas eat tiger sharks. But in many food chains, sharks, uh, a large shark would be the top of that particular food chain. But if there's an orca coming by, it doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, the There are also lots of species of sharks. There's more than 500 species of sharks. The biggest one is bigger than a school bus. The smallest one is about the size of your forearm. And uh, with with a range that wide, you're going to have some species that are not top predators. In fact, many species are prey for other sharks or even for tunas or groupers. There are okay. also plenty of species of sharks that are what are called meso predators, which are sort of mid-range apex predators. That, like talking about the difference between a raccoon and a wolf in a forest ecosystem, raccoons still play an important role, but they're not the biggest, baddest thing around. Right. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. And so, it's it's the is the great white shark the largest, or what's what what shark is the size of a bus? Because that, that's, that's the, not a great that's leg, the is whale it? shark. Okay, the whale uh, they, shark, of course. Yeah. And the second largest is the basking shark, which you do have in BC, though they're endangered under the Species at Risk Act. Um, those are very similar to whale sharks, though they live in colder water. And those two species are filter feeders. They're, so they're called. It's called the whale shark because it's big, but also because it feeds like the great whales. It just ha swims around with its mouth open and filters enormous amounts of water and sucks the little baby shrimp and fish out of there. Okay. Okay, so a whale shark is the largest, and uh, what's the second then story? A basking Wait. shark. Basking shark. Okay, amazing. Great whites and, are and, some of the largest, uh, and yeah. they're the largest that actively hunts. Uh, people say sometimes people call them the largest predator shark, but whale sharks are predators too. Eating lots of tiny animals is still eating animals. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Um, so when it comes to uh i mean the the vast amount of sharks i mean are you are you as a marine biologist are you specifically looking at um specific types of sharks or do you kind of kind of grab all sharks in the same compass and then and assess all of them it depends on the project uh generally speaking i'm working with threatened species of sharks in united states waters so that is 70 species of shark skates rays and chimeras out of okay. about 1,500 total. There are other species that sometimes get caught in our sampling gear. There are other projects that I work on with colleagues that are not my main work. Mm -hmm. uh, but generally speaking, I'm looking at the species in the greatest need of conservation attention within US waters. Okay. And so you said 70 uh, different species are currently in endangered. Is that correct? Threatened or endangered. Are threatened. Uh, Right. So if you so the the system the there's a group called the IUCN Red List of of threatened and endangered species and that's an international group of scientific experts that uses mutually agreed upon criteria to evaluate the best available data and determine this species is is near threatened but they're okay but not great but keep an eye on them this species is least concerned they're fine don't worry about them this species mm -hmm. is endangered this species is critically endangered. Uh, okay. And if people want to learn more about this, you can get trained in, in how to be an IUCN Red List Assessor uh, at conservationtraining.org. But this is a, it's a really important uh, set of scientific expertise. And I, I use that sort of to shape which species I work on. I also mm. work for the Red List Tuna Group uh, for as uh, one of my consultancies, sort of side businesses. But Right on. So that's super cool. I, I think for me, I, I've we've heard all these things. I'm sure our listeners are similar to that, you know, you hear threatened, endangered um, and extinct. What are how do you classify them into these categories? At what point are they becoming threatened, endangered, et cetera? Like what there, are the there are hard number cutoffs for this? Uh, and they're, that's all in the IUCN Red List of Categories and Criteria document. Okay. And this gets this gets very mathematical very quickly, but the, a thirty a greater than a thirty percent population decline over thirty years or three generation lengths, whichever is greater, 
uh, is okay. vulnerable. It's uh, greater than 50% in some cases. If their total population size is less than a certain number, if their total range is less than a certain number, and their ter- and their total population is less than there's a, there's a lot of math that goes into it. But it's yeah. the, the red list is often perceived as somebody's opinion, and it's not. It's a lot of hard data and numbers and replicable criteria. Because mm-hmm. you're you're obviously going to be sampling like you're sampling. You're, you don't know exactly how many mm-hmm. uh, of, of that species there are. You're kind of making a good estimate or a, a, a guess as to how many there are based on the sample you have, right? Yeah. If I were to ask you to count how many birds are on the quad, the main quad at UBC, that would be an annoying task, but you could do it. Yeah. But if I were to ask you how many fish are in the Salish Sea, you can't do that. And uh, the the famous fisheries biologist John Shepard is quoted as saying, "Counting fish is just like counting trees, except they're invisible and they move." So where there are a, a, yes, scientific sampling approaches to try to to determine trends in population sizes. Yeah, and I'm I'm sure there's I mean of course there's the, the science is quite complex, but trying to figure out where to sample from is a very unique thing within marine marine biology where you know as as a researcher in psychology i can just ask whatever population know it's biased uh you know i can take a group of students at ubc or i can take you know a sample from somewhere in ontario or in the states but when you're looking for species you have to know exactly where they are in the world and where they migrate and where they go right Mm -hmm. so how do you how do you fit like I've, I've always been like amazed at how people can figure out where exactly all the species are around the world yeah, it's tricky, and it's it's all this standing on the shoulders of giants type stuff. You're no one figures this out on their own. Where you we're yeah. building upon a huge body of data um, from lots and lots of collaborators, but lots of times you're more interested in what species are in a particular place. Mm. Uh, so you go to that particular place and just sample and see what's there. Uh, it's more right. complicated than that, but uh, that's that's a lot of it. And m- for the most part, my work is not finding how many are there, but deciding what to do with that information and synthesizing mm-hmm. lots of information from any species that right. often others gather. Yeah. Like saying, you know, we have a lake, we know we can guess how many there are in this lake. How do we sustain and conserve this kind of like these species within this lake? Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So, I mean, I kind of want to get a little bit of knowledge and I'm sure our listeners do too, as to how you go about studying these sharks. You know, you see, I've seen a couple of pictures of you with the sharks that you're, you know, you're grabbing and, and studying. It can look to somebody that, you know, that doesn't fish or, you know, I mean, fishermen might do things very differently too, but how you go about ethically getting sharks, measuring them and testing them. How do you go about doing that? Yeah. So, over the years, it's been determined that the most important thing for ensuring the survival of the shark after its research workup is getting the research workup done and getting the animal back in the water as quickly as possible, which means if it is better to handle the animal a little bit roughly and get the process done sooner than to be ginger uh, about it and uh, to have the process take three times as long. I'll tell you that the 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 lab that I work out of now uh, that that I partner with, uh, it's called Field School in South Florida, and they have a research vessel and they have a water pump that goes in the shark's mouth so it can breathe when it's out of the water. That also give that also gives the bitey end of the shark something to focus on other than me. But the still from when the, from when the shark is first brought on board the research vessel, or if it's a big one brought alongside the research vessel to when it's released and swimming away free, we're talking three to five minutes. Um, and it's breathing the whole time because it has the water pump. So being quick is is really, really important. And w- part of that is having a, a really, really well-trained team. Uh, it's been described as like a NASCAR pit crew. You just go in quickly, do your job. You go in, do your job, get out of the way. Next person goes in. You're not, um, not dilly-dallying. Not everyone knows their job. Everyone knows when they go. Uh, and you're talking to each other calmly the whole time. Yeah. So how big is this team uh, usually? Uh, does, it, does it differ, or how big is the team usually around? Like how big of it? How big of the team is it? So field school is involved in training the next generation of marine scientists, which is one one reason I really like working with them. Uh, so it's often the people who are doing these particular research workup tasks are students uh, who are who are learning how to be shark scientists. 
So it would be a bigger team than you might otherwise need because we're trying to train as many people as possible. So one person's only job is to go in and bring measuring tape. And one person's mm. only job is to go in and take the sampling scissors and take a little bit of skin off the fin. And one person's only job is to do the, these other things like that. But usually we're talking about two or three people who are holding the, securing the shark and holding it still, depending on how big it is, sometimes four, once five, uh, and then four, five, six people who are going in and helping with the data. But you could really do that part with, with fewer people. Yeah. So what kind of data are you collecting on these threatened species? It depends on the project. Uh, a lot of times we really need to know extremely basic information about these species that because we don't know much of anything at all. So it can be something like, where do they go when they're not here? How many of them are here during what times of year? What do they eat? What eats them? What do they compete mm. with for food? What is the reason why they're, what, what's killing them? And can we alleviate those threats? Um, how many babies do they have? How long do they live? Uh, so a lot of, uh, there are a lot of questions that, that need to be answered. And usually it's often it's different teams working on different questions, uh, mm -hmm. all sort of collaborating in general. Uh, the sorts of stuff that I'm working on is mostly uh, movement ecology. Where do they go? Where do they spend their time? Uh, where can they be found uh, so we can help find places to protect them? Uh, as well as food web ecology, which is what are they eating? How do they fit into the food chain? What would happen to the food chain if they're not there anymore? Uh, yeah. I also work in the, the reason I'm in Washington, D.C. is I work on a lot of the policy side. So turning that turning that science into effective science based advocacy for environmental nonprofit groups or into law and regulation through government agencies. Amazing. Yeah, that's that's really cool. So, I mean, building off of that, then, David, let's let's kind of talk about you, you mentioned why like why sharks are so important in, in the ecosystem and what happens if they weren't there. Like most people would think, oh, sharks not being a part of the ecosystem would be a good thing because they're, you know, they're predators, that everything would just kind of flourish if they weren't there. I'm sure that's not true. <laughs> yep. So predators help keep the food chain in balance. And there's only so much food available for prey. There's only so much habitat available for prey. And when you lose that top-down control from the loss of predators, everything else can unravel really, really fast. You suddenly have way too many prey animals. What are they going to eat? They're going to overeat what they would have otherwise eaten. And sometimes that's something like trees or grass that's habitat for so many other things. Um, and then not only are your prey species all messed up, but everything that lived in the prey species environment gets all messed up. So it's, it's all the circle of life and all that good stuff. <laughs> yeah, of course. So, I mean, for me, when I'm thinking of these threatened species, you know, how immediate of an of a concern is it to you right now? I mean, you're talking about the policies and changing these things uh, now, you know, is this a is this a significant threat to marine conservation or just like our, our our ecosystems right now? Do you think that it's like you know one of those big issues that need to be addressed? Absolutely, we call it the worst conservation crisis you've never heard of. Uh, there are many species of sharks that are critically endangered. It could really be lost uh, forever within the next decade or so. Um, there are more that are endangered. There are more than that that are vulnerable, which means not doing great but not yet endangered. Uh, so there are absolutely a lot of species that face serious conservation challenges. Mm -hmm. And so what are the main like approaches, I guess, you know, you as a researcher, you're studying it and trying to figure out what's going on, but what policies and things are necessary to improve the likelihood that these sharks will get removed from that threatened category or that vulnerable category and just be thriving? It depends on the species. It depends on the on the situation. But generally speaking, the reason why sharks are in trouble is because humans are killing too many of them, and the okay. in various ways. And the solution is to reduce the number of sharks being killed by humans in various ways. And do you, I don't know if your podcast has like a show notes page or something like that. Absolutely. But yeah. I have an open access paper in the journal Animal Conservation that explains all the available policies designed for people who are not lawyers or PhDs in environmental science that I can send your way. So if Amazing, you want to yeah. learn how to protect sharks, it is meant as the, the first thing you read about that that introduces you to the, the concept. 
Amazing. We love mandatory reading here. So this is yes, great. Homework. <laughs> um, we will definitely include that in the show notes then, David, because uh, you know, anybody that's curious as to what's going on and what the actual, you know, reality of these situations are, uh, I'm sure it'll be really informative. That being said, I mean, what like I don't know, I've never seen any sharks, shark meat or anything like that being sold. I'm I know I know we're not eating it like that much like at least in in BC or wherever I'm wherever I'm at in Canada, what are people hunting sharks for? What is the purpose of the overhunting? Yeah, it's for, it's for food, uh, and Canada was one of the largest shark fishing nations in the world. That's part of why I did my postdoc at SFU was looking at some of that issue. I spent some time out on in Vancouver Island looking at the now largely defunct uh, spiny dogfish fishery, which was one of the largest shark fishing lar- l- largest shark fisheries in North America, and people in the surrounding communities that we were talking to had no idea that it ever existed. And it's weird. Uh, there is a new book uh, by Jackie King, who's a DFO employee of, of Sharks and Rays of British Columbia. It's a great book. And it notes in the introduction that lots of people in British Columbia don't know that there are sharks and rays in British Columbia. And I had that experience when I lived there. I had so many of my neighbors, including people who were PhD environmental scientists, said, what do you mean you're studying Canadian sharks? We don't have sharks in Canada. Yeah, you do. There are a lot of sharks in Canada. And it's fascinating to me that people just don't know that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I had no clue. So I mean, the fact that there, it was just across the, you know, the island where one of the most, like the largest fisheries is, is, is kind of mind blowing that I've never heard of it, nor have I heard anybody talk about it. Uh, that In that case though, David, so I guess, that is kind of what you're doing and that's the mm-hmm. purpose for why you're, you know, advocating for this and, and increasing the general population's knowledge about these issues. Um, what, um, what, what, what do we do, I guess, is, is, what yeah. I'm, is what I'm trying to get at. You know, what do we do? You know, we, we can read that mandatory reading that you suggested to us yes. to understand the policies and conservation uh, laws. What else do we do? So, People find this to be an incredibly unsatisfying answer, but sometimes there's not something that an individual can do right now to solve this problem. Right. Uh, sometimes when I, I, particularly here in the U.S., uh, where we have somewhat of a different natural resource management system, uh, sometimes I give talks in schools and museums and things like that, uh, and people say, what can we do? And I say, you're going to hate this answer, but in seven months, there's a NOAA advisory panel meeting and you can send a comment in. And it would be great if you did that. And they say, but what, sure, sure. But what can I do now? Uh, <laughs> uh, in, in general, the, the things that people can do is, as individuals that help the ocean is eat, not eat unsustainable seafood. So there are ways of fishing that are friendly for the environment that you can eat guilt-free no matter what certain misinformation nonsense on Netflix will tell you. Um, that's called sustainable seafood. There's also absolutely are a lot of harmful ways of catching fish. That's unsustainable seafood. Don't eat that, and that will be the that'll help the ocean a great deal. Uh, that does not mean you have to never eat seafood again. It means eat sustainable seafood if you're going to eat seafood. Uh, there are a lot of sustainable seafood options in BC where you live. I, I miss the sable fish several times a week. Uh, I think, oh man, I wish I could eat that right now. But you can't get it here. Uh, this much of the salmon, uh, is the wild caught salmon out there is sustainably caught. Um, you can, though this is not much of an issue to sharks. It's certainly an issue for the ocean as a whole, uh, reducing your carbon footprint and supporting politicians who fight climate change. Uh, also not a big issue for sharks, but for the ocean as a whole, use less single use plastic because that can end up in the ocean and cause all kinds of environmental harms. And if you're especially motivated, re- donating time or money to reputable environmental nonprofits uh, is, is a great thing to do. Or uh, if you're local, if, if there's are researchers in, commun- in your community that need your help, uh, that can be great. And I, I will note that on my social media, I share ways that people can get involved uh, when there are these calls for public comments, which are usually a few times a year. And never right after I give my biggest talk of the year. Uh, but 
So one thing you can do if you if you're long term committed and want to learn what and you're willing to help sharks not just right now while you're thinking about it listening to the podcast but for months and years in the future is subscribe to my updates on social media I'm at Why Sharks Matter on Twitter Facebook and Instagram and when I sh- I retweet other people's calls for help and I share ways that people can get involved several times a year absolutely and and we have you as a we're connected on Twitter as well. We'll link it whenever we, we post the podcast. Right. We recommend that people do follow you because, uh, I mean, w- you're the only source for shark information that I have, uh, David. And, it, <laughs> oh, and that's it's a, a lot. lot of power. <laughs> it is a lot of power. But, I mean, you do also do an amazing job of actually, you know, consistently and day to day updating and just continuing to publish and post stuff uh, and retweet uh, relevant stuff uh, for, uh, you know, marine conservation so it's great um that being said i know so so this is awesome that's really good we now we know you know a bit more about sharks we know why they're important how to help how to help uh you know maintain their uh the ecosystem or at least do a little bit of work on our own um you have a new book coming out i do which is at aptly aptly named why sharks matter yeah i actually Uh, had i've been on social media at why sharks matter since 2009 but i actually had the book title before i had the uh, amazing so i've been writing this book for a long time uh it is called (laughs) why sharks matter a deep dive with the world's most misunderstood animals and uh it's through johns hopkins university press it is available for pre-order now you can get that through johns hopkins university press uh it is on amazon it is in amazon's global marketplace uh, Barnes and Noble in the U.S. has it online. Uh, it, it will be delivered in May of 2022, but it is available for pre-orders now. Uh, and it is not a textbook. It is meant for ocean <laughs> enthusiasts who would like to learn a little bit more about what's going on with sharks and how they can help. Yeah, absolutely. And we will obviously be posting once we post the episode. We'll have all that information so pe- our listeners can go in and check it out, pre-order it for May. Um, we're putting this out during Shark Week. Um, you've, I've seen that you have a little bit of an opinion on or have a certain feeling <laughs> about Shark Week, David. Um, and I'd love to talk about it. You know, Shark Week to me, the way that I see it, is it's kind of taken the same it's the newer version of the history channel uh in the sense that the history channel used to be about history but now it's about reality tv and And, ice uh, nazi aliens and yeah (laughs) so i mean something happened along the way that kind of jumbled things up um what the hell happened why is it so problematic and what you know what do you think what do you think of it first off and why do you think it's problematic how much time do you have? <laughs> um, so Shark Week, a lot of people, I, I another mandatory reading for everyone. I wrote for its 30th anniversary a few years ago, uh, a, a sort of retrospective for the Washington Post about all the things that it's done that are so great and also the many, many things that it does poorly. Uh, but it, it, is the, it is measurably the largest temporary increase in Americans paying attention to any ocean science or conservation topic of the year. Uh, it is measurably the time that people are thinking about sharks the most. Uh, you can tell this with seasonal patterns in Wikipedia lookups. Uh, but it is it is the biggest stage of sci- of environmental science TV and marine biology TV in the world, and it is such a, a missed opportunity. It's what I'm describing there just sounds great. And they try to fe- they try to include some scientists in many of the episodes, but it's it's a huge missed opportunity because they focus on a lot of just nonsense, and they give they give this stage to people who have no business being presented as experts. They share demonstrably wrong and sometimes harmful misinformation. Uh, one of their shows a few years ago famously resulted in me and many other ocean scientists and government officials getting death threats from viewers uh, because it misrepresented. Uh, some issues with science. Uh, they, there are huge issues with diversity in, in Shark Week. There was a great article by Andy Dienard, uh, who is a reality TV journalist uh, last year, uh, that pointed out that of 28 Shark Week specials last year, uh, in the promo materials that were distributed for them, there were zero women's names listed as featured experts. More than half of my field is women. You would never know that from watching Shark Week. And we, we've been hearing so much how much representation matters. 
Uh, an another thing that I had only, I feel embarrassed that I only recently realized is about a third of the Shark Week shows take place in either the Bahamas or South Africa. I think last year was the first time I ever noticed a black scientist featured on the show. And it was, it was uh, two black scientists that were briefly featured and I believe had th maybe 30 seconds of speaking time. And there are black marine biologists. Uh, there are black shark scientists. There are women shark scientists and marine biologists. At a certain point, uh, it's not an accident that Discovery's doing this. And it's not, we tried and it just didn't work out. They've made a conscious choice. And we have had, I have col women colleagues who've explicitly told me that Discovery producers told them that they think their audience doesn't see women or minorities as credible experts. So they're, you know, why do you think that is? It's because you're not promoting them as credible experts. Yeah. Absolutely. Wow. Wow. So there's diversity issues, like Mis are yeah, diversity, everywhere. misinformation, yeah. giving people yeah. who are just Looney Tune fringe wackadoodles the <laughs> access to the biggest stage in science education TV, uh, and <laughs> just they used to just straight up make up nonsense. They had actors pretending to be scientists and CGI videos of things that did not happen. Uh, they, uh, they, and even now when it's better than that, that part is better than it used to be. They, yeah. uh, still have, um, just silly nonsense that the most basic fact checking, I could have fact checked most of the shows when I was eight. Um, uh, and, and a lot of us know someone who's eight and knows a ton about sharks. Yeah. Uh, though the, that person knows more than anyone who's writing these scripts. Yeah. And so, I mean, issues uh, upon like just a million issues here. So, with the with Shark Week, I mean, because you've talked about how important that platform is, and it's so true that you know anybody, I, I mean, the majority of people out there have heard of Shark Week if they don't actively you know engage and and watch it. Um, they're aware of Shark Week, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's kind of like a cultural phenomenon now. We're it aware is that Shark Week a thing. And so if you had that platform, David, you know, you had all those those ears and you had all those people that wanted to listen, what would you change? I mean, if not everything. Yeah, a lot. <laughs> I would change you, a lot. You know, uh, yeah. they, so there are every every year there's like three or four really good science focused, natural history focused shows focuses on an actual scientific question real experts and appropriate experts addressing it. It's not sensationalized. Um, and it's, but the other 20 to 25 shows, and they have so many, and I think I might be the only one who watches them all. Uh, the, the other ones are just either range from not necessary to be made and is not adding anything to the world to actively bad. Uh, I, I also give them all, I, I live tweet these, uh, with fact checks and commentary, and then I give them a letter grade. I think last year I gave two A's and 15 D's. Uh, which was wor actually the worst in about five years. But the, what I would like to, what in general, what I would like people to know, and I'll, I'll note that educational TV need not be stuffy, dry, boring science class, but it should contain a message and you should learn something from it and it should be true. Uh, what I would like for people to know about sharks is that sharks are cool and sharks are not a threat to you and your family. And sharks are really important to a healthy functioning ecosystem. We're better off with sharks than we are without them. Many sharks are in trouble and there are tangible specific things that you can do right now to help. And Shark Week does not convey those things. Uh, they, in some cases, they convey the opposite of those things. They're, uh, the sorts of stuff that they say you can do to help are just nonsense. There was a graphic that they shared on their social media about five years ago uh, that said, here are five things you can do to help protect sharks. One of those things was report shark attacks. One and like what? What? How many people are in a situation where they're the only person who observes a, a shark biting someone? It and none of those things were anything that I would consider a way that a thing that you could do that it could actually help in any kind of meaningful way. Um, they they also you would get the impression from Shark Week that if you dip your toe in the bathtub, a shark's going to eat your whole family. Uh, that they have every year they have two, three, four, five. Um, episodes that are just dramatic special effects gory reenactments of shark bites from the news but these events are so rare that you'll see the same story told on two or three different shows 
Uh, an, an absolutely crazy thing that a colleague of mine found, they did a media analysis looking at how uh, shark, sharks biting people is portrayed in the news. And in about 40% of reported shark attacks in Australia, and when you think shark attack, you think of Jaws, right? You think of this giant monstrous shark stalking the coast and killing people because it's evil and bad. Uh, in 40% of reported shark attacks in Australia, the shark did not physically touch the person at all. It swam near them in a way the person found menacing. Uh, so, and sh Shark Week is a big part of the reason why people think that sharks are bloodthirsty killing machines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, th there's probably not that many species of sharks that would actually, like, want to to eat a human right like the so size no size shark ever wouldn't... has eaten a human basically yeah. uh, they, they sometimes bite, it, bite us it. immediately realize we're not what they thought we were and and yeah. leave uh there have been some cases where people dead at sea have been scavenged uh but we're i mean we're just not on the menu there's there's too yeah. much, we have too much bone because yeah. we live on land uh think of uh, how much fat and blubber a, a whale or a, a an elephant seal has or a tuna uh, compared to us and right. it, we're just it's not worth the energy exchange to digest yeah. us versus what you get we're just yeah. not something you need to worry about one of the shark bite reenactment specials last year was especially egregiously nonsense the person reported that they were bitten by a shark they swam to shore they pulled themselves onto shore the shark came onto shore and got them and dragged them back underwater that did not happen <laughs> i i don't know what happened to this poor person I'm glad that they're okay <laughs> enough to tell their story, but that the shark did not chase them onto land and drag them back into the water. That did not occur. <laughs> I don't. Uh, I don't imagine it like used its fins as legs and kind of went after them uh, on shore. It's just, <laughs> it's tough to run on sand as is. Come on, if you don't have feet, it's a little bit harder. <laughs> uh, so yeah i mean there's just so much to it i mean that's really interesting it makes sense i mean when you say it it just makes so much more sense that you know we're pretty calorically shallow yes. food options right we're, like we have we're these not dense right. bones that we need to support our weight on land out of the buoyant support of water uh, yeah. and their normal prey does not have that yeah yeah absolutely and so anytime that you know you see these attacks i mean the majority of them would probably be just them either doing it because they were really hungry and didn't know any better or it was like in defense, I imagine. Mistaken identity is a commonly repeated theory. Uh, if you look okay. at the silhouette of a surfer from below, it looks an awful lot like the silhouette of a seal from below. Okay. Um, sharks are not, you, sharks are really well adapted predators with amazing senses, but they're not used to telling the difference between neoprene and blubber mm. uh, because they're in, for their 450 million year existence, there's been neoprene for the blink of an eye. Right interesting yeah yeah it's really interesting so so with the uh with regards to like attacks just to kind of like give people a little more of a you know a, a reasonable realistic expectation here how how fatal are these attacks like in a typical when hit? year uh there's 50 to 70 humans in the world that are bitten by sharks of which maybe six to 12 die okay. uh, in a typical year more people die falling off cliffs while taking selfies and not paying attention than are killed by sharks. A lot I'm sure more that's people, quite high now. <laughs> yes. A lot more people in a typical year are killed by flower pots falling on their head from above as they walk down the street. A lot more people in a typical year are killed by toaster ovens malfunctioning. A mm. lot more people in a typical year are killed by vending machines. This is just not something that you need to worry about. There's never been yeah. a fatal shark attack in Canada. Uh, there are lots of sharks in Canada. Uh, if you have ever been in the ocean, there was a shark near you and it knew you were there. Yeah. And you probably had <laughs> no idea story. it was there and it left you alone and you had a lovely day. You had a lovely time. Yeah. You had a great day at the beach. Uh, that That's so that's that's great to, ha to have that information, too. And I think like, um, you know, before we wrap up, David, I, I mean, mm -hmm. we, there's so much to it. And there's, and, you know, this is just like because of shark week it's you know it's perpetuated it's it's a pretty simple reason why like myths and misconceptions are are common with sharks is probably due to the shark week uh and you know just like the sensationalization uh in movies what do, are like other myths and misconceptions that you think are either a really funny 
um, that you like to disprove or ones that you think are particularly problematic that you think everybody should know about? Yeah, there's been this emerging trend, and this is fueled largely by the rise of social media, that everyone wants to be the expert, everyone wants to be the leader, everyone wants to be the face of the movement. But ocean conservation is a very technical challenge that requires technical skills. It doesn't necessarily require a PhD, but it requires some degree of training or experience or knowledge and not just wanting to help. And there are lots of people that basically guess what we should do, and they make these really viral, scary sounding social media posts, and they get a ton of attention, and that doesn't actually help anything. And then actual experts have to spend time dispelling it and saying, but don't get discouraged because we do actually still need your help with this other real thing. Uh, Mm -hmm. And it's awful. And it's always, I'm always being set up to be the bad guy. Uh, But for a funnier one, I guess, to not end on a downer, uh, (laughs) that one of my favorite myths is that sharks are terrified of dolphins. So if you're at the beach and you see a dolphin, it's totally safe to go in the water because there's no sharks there. Sharks and dolphins are near each other all the time because they eat the same stuff. If you see Mm. a dolphin feeding, there is a shark feeding right under it. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. And are dolphins, should we be scared of dolphins? I uh, wouldn't want to get in a fight with one. You wouldn't win. They're a lot bigger than people think, and they're very, very strong. Um, And they're, they're... are we, you get, when you get into issues of like morality with animals, most animals are sort of generally considered amoral, not yeah. immoral. Like they just don't have the capacity for dealing with things in moral ways. Dolphins are pretty smart, uh, mm-hmm. and they have been known to do some things that I would characterize as as bad and not just yeah. you know wild animal things. Mm-hmm. I've heard some I've heard some nasty things about dolphins as well. Yeah, if, yeah they're if all you true. Had- yeah, I, I'm sure a bunch of them are misconstrued too. There's no Dolphin Week though, so we can't really you know, pick it apart. But would you, you know, what do you think? Talking about fights, just just hypothetically, if you had to, because there's so much in popular media. Uh, I one of the com- one of the common movies that comes out is like giant octopus versus mega shark. Yes, for example. Who do you got in a fight, 1v1? Is it a giant octopus or is it the mega shark? I'm assuming you're going to side on the mega shark. So I have actually seen all of those movies. I have a, <laughs> I actually have an academic lecture on the rise of the bad shark movie uh, that I've given for Nerd Night and also as an invited seminar once. Um, so I actually had to call the, ed- the director of that movie because it was unclear who won. Uh, it was, and a, it was, I was a draw, a right? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and I got in a fight with a friend and I was like, I'm, I'm using my credentials as an ocean journalist to figure out the answer to this. Um, yeah, I mean, I, oct- octopuses beat sharks. You, there, there's a famous video of that happening in an aquarium, sure. But sharks eat octopuses all the time. And it is mm. octopuses, not octopi. Um, mm. The Yeah, sharks are often the biggest, baddest thing around. But orcas, there's nothing that can take an orca. Uh, right. Uh, octopuses are very very strong and smart and flexible in their own right yeah there's a lot of a lot of cool stuff out there but i love all those movies <laughs> it's up for debate that it's there's no there's no solid answer so i mean no. if if it was uh, giant octopus versus mega shark versus mega orca it's a clear cut it's mega oh, orca, mega orca. yeah <laughs> of the same size too so this is interesting um that that being said, too, I mean, with um, what was I guess? I, I compl- I'm completely lost because my brain just fried after having the I know the feeling. Uh, I I think it's uh, you know, for me, those are always really fun to 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 you know, they're they're good B movies. You know, they're 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 made for just to be fun. Mm-hmm. But I think that like uh, the megalodon, I think that's kind of what it was mo- modeled after, right? The yes. the mag- the mega shark. Um, and there's still there's still people thinking that megalodons are a thing today. Like this just yes. shows you that shark you had played a role of... in that. Yeah, uh, yeah. They claim they falsely claimed that megalodon is not extinct, but is just hiding, and that scientists and the government know that and are lying to you. And you know, there's no you can't draw a, a straight line from Shark Week and Animal Planets. Mermaids are real, and megalodon is real, and the government's lying to you. Don't trust the experts to what we're seeing now with COVID denial. But yeah. certainly, it didn't help. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I know anecdotally, it's some of the same people involved. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think like um, it's a really interesting, you know, premise—the idea that you want everybody to be, you know, their own their own agent of 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 thought and be able to to actually, you know, c- 
critically think about whether or not it's true or not. But when you're hearing something that's labeled as, you know, discovery or history channel stuff where it's like, this happened, this is the truth, and it's framed as if it's empirically driven. That's I can see the issues with that. And we, you know, we recently had a podcast with a couple of researchers that that specifically looked at beliefs in conspiracy theories. And mm-hmm. it's just it is perpetuated by popular media. And, you know, especially during COVID with all the vaccination conspiracies and other things like that, it just seems like it's ramping up. Yes. And uh and so Shark Week, uh I'm sure you're excited about, you know, it, it being over in a few mm-hmm. weeks. Uh, I'm glad that you came on, David, to dispel Thanks all Thanks for having things. me. Yeah. Yeah. And, if, yeah. and but, I'm always happy to answer people's questions about sharks on social media. So follow, awesome. follow and ask away. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And so we will definitely link to that if you're, all, if you're listening right now and you have your phone open at Why Sharks Matter on Twitter. Um, he's a wealth of knowledge when it comes to sharks and and marine biology. So thanks so much for coming on, David. Uh, And yeah, this was really fun. Thanks for having me.